This video is sponsored by Squarespace. To understand what exactly mushrooms are and why they are so darn delicious, we must first understand that this is not a vegetable. This is not even a plant. Mushrooms are not plants, nor are they animals, though they can kind of look like it when you speed up their growth. Yes, I filmed a mushroom time lapse in my basement. It was a ton of work to set up, so you best believe I'm going to get a lot of mileage out of that footage right now. Buckle up. This is not a plant, nor even part of a plant. It is part of a fungus. And and fungi are their own kingdom of life, totally apart from plants or animals. Fungi are their own thing. From a culinary perspective, I think they're really more like animals. They usually have complete protein, all the essential amino acids we need and we find in all meat but only a few plants. Mushrooms stick to pans the same way that meat does. They brown the same way that meat does. They're rich in glutamates, the source of that meaty umami taste, and they even kind of look like meat and they feel like meat when you chew them. In light of all these factors, it should not be surprising that from a biological perspective, this actually is closer to an animal than it is to a plant. Says who? Says her. My name is Dr. Biango Daniels. And I'm a mycologist. So animals like you and me, we have stomachs and we have to, you know, eat food. Plants have to make their food. And fungi are a lot more similar to animals, even though they don't have stomachs. They have to secrete enzymes and acids and kind of digest their food and then slurp it back up. Yum. Well, another fungus that we deal with in the kitchen all the time is yeast, right? And maybe yeast don't seem very animal-like because they are unicellular, one cell per organism. But mushrooms, or the fungi that make mushrooms, are multicellular, complex beings with organs, or at least organ-like structures. The mushroom that we eat is basically an organ of the fungus. Specifically, it's a reproductive organ. Kind of even looks like it, doesn't it? The mushroom is only part of the fungus. It's kind of an attachment, an appendage of the fungus. This is an imperfect analogy for reasons that we'll explain later, but for right now, go with it. If you think about our appendages, they are part of us, but if you cut one off, we are still ourselves, right? Our self is here. Our main body is here. The appendage is part of us, but it's not integral to us. Similar thing down here. Cut the mushroom away and the fungus's main body is still there. You just can't see it. So whenever you look at a mushroom, you should think of it as the tip of the iceberg. There's all of this stuff underneath the soil and it's probably the biggest part of that organism. It's down in there, inside the rotting tree or whatever other substrate the fungus is slowly digesting and slurping up. The organism's main body is inside the wood. And here it is, the mycelium. If any part of the fungus is the fungus, this is it. And these particular ones in Petri dishes belong to Hunter Pruitt, farmer owner of Middle Georgia Mushroom. It's really the world's decomposer. This little organism right here breaks down the the lignin in the tree then continues on just just plowing through it it goes in through the bark usually right where the bark meets the wood and it just climbs up and colonizes that tree but that only happens as that tree is dead and as that tree is starting to decay that's the importance of mushrooms in our society if if we didn't have them our our forest would be just piled high full of trees that have grown and fell if they could grow anymore because there would be nothing to decay and decompose that rotted wood, right? As you can see, this organism is about way more than dinner. I mean, I love mushrooms, super tasty, super pretty, but the mycelium, the hidden mycelium, that's really where the action is when it comes to this being. They sort of are doing a lot of things on a cellular level in the mycelia that is sort of like beneath notice. Like they're recombining, they're exchanging, they're, you know, kind of, you know, having sex with themselves. It's very racy stuff, these mushrooms. And then once they've done that, then they make the fruiting body and they kind of produce spores. Fruiting body is the more scientific and broader term that encompasses mushrooms. Mushroom is an informal word that people tend to use to describe the types of fruiting bodies that we would normally eat. 
The archetypal mushroom is this guy, the white button. It's got a stem, a cap, and gills underneath. But there are other species that are very morphologically different, and yet we also call them mushrooms, like morels, or these beautiful lion's mane mushrooms that Hunter grows. Very tasty, very different from a toadstool-type mushroom, and yet we call them mushrooms anyway, probably just because we eat them. What I've been showing you here on this dead tree in my neighborhood is a polypore, or bracket fungus. People People usually call these fruiting bodies conchs, not mushrooms, even though they're the same basic thing as a mushroom. It's an umbrella the mycelium sends up to drop its spores into the wind, spreading its genetic material far and wide. Biologically, it's basically the same thing as a mushroom, but the fruiting bodies of polypores are really, really hard and woody, usually, and so people don't usually eat them, and so nobody calls them mushrooms. They call them conchs. Same deal with this lichen, British soldier lichen, they call it, because the fruiting body is reminded people of redcoats. Those fruiting bodies are also super hard, so nobody ever thinks about eating them, so maybe that's why nobody ever calls them mushrooms. But again, biologically speaking, it's the same basic thing. It's an arm reaching up from the fungus and casting its spores into the wind so they will go off and grow into Fungus Junior. Look at this plated mycelium in the lab at Middle Georgia Mushroom. See those little blue dots there? Those are the very beginnings of fruiting bodies, blue oyster mushrooms specifically. That's how they look when they're all grown up. When they're super tiny like this, they're called pins. Here's what those pins look like a few days later, and a few days after that, pink oyster mushrooms. In this case, yum. And under the microscope, you can see those black dots. Those are the spores getting ready to drop. Most people think mushrooms taste best when you harvest them right before they start to drop their spores. After that, the fruiting body starts to decompose and go slimy because when the spores are done, the mushroom has finished its job. The mycelium doesn't need it anymore. So that's one answer to the question, what even is a mushroom? It is the temporary reproductive appendage of a fungus. Here's where that appendage analogy breaks down. To varying extents, animals like us can regenerate severed parts the way a fungus can. Break off the lizard's tail, it grows a new tail. But the severed tail does not grow a new lizard. If you were to say, chop off my hand, my hand would cease to be an organism. It would just become a heap of dying cells. I'm the organism. The hand is not going to regrow a whole extra human attached to it. Though I wish it would, I could use a second pair of hands around here, but unfortunately with humans, this is just not possible. With fungi, though, this is exactly what can happen. You can cut off a part of the fungus, that's what that thing in the middle is, and under the right conditions, that severed part will grow into a clone of the original fungus. That's what Hunter is doing in this petri dish. He's cloning a particularly good genetic specimen that he wants to grow more of. This is possible in part because of what the fungus is made out of. Almost all of this fungus, the above ground part and the below ground part, they're all made out of the same basic material called hyphae. A hypha is a string of fungal cells, often only one cell wide. It's that thin. They're these long, very thin sort of like uh, filaments, and then they sort of like twist and wind together to create greater structures. Now down in the mycelium, those filaments twist themselves into these parallel cords called rhizomorphs. They're called that because they look and function a lot like plant roots. Rhizome is a kind of plant root. They serve as like highways. So, you know, they're secreting enzymes, they're moving out into the environment, they're searching for food, and they're kind of transporting it throughout these networks. It's really cool. When the mycelium is ready to send out its spores, those hyphae just grow up and out and then tangle around each other into these big wadded masses. That's the fruiting body. The fruiting body is literally just a tangled mass of those same hyphae. The mushroom and the mycelium are made out of the same stuff. Probably the main reason we eat the fruiting body and not the mycelium is that it'd be really hard to disentangle all of those little filaments from the rotting wood that they are growing through, right? Though there is a notable case of mycelia that people do eat, tempeh. This surprisingly tasty Indonesian meat substitute consists of soybeans bound in the mycelium of the fungus that is eating them. We eat the whole thing, and it is a fermented, protein-rich delight. Speaking of protein and carbs and other delicious things that we like and need to eat, why are they in here? Why does the mushroom have them? 
I mean, you can think of all of the components of a mushroom serving a function to that microorganism that's not different from like the proteins and carbs in our bodies. Fair enough, but if we look at plants, their fruits often contain these delicious and nourishing substances expressly for us animals to eat. A tomato, for example, is full of sugar in part because the vine that grew it wants me to eat its fruit so that I will then disperse the seeds contained therein. So does the mushroom want to be eaten in the same way? Dr. Biongo Daniel says, not really. From what we know about mushrooms, a lot of their spore dispersal, so how they kind of get to new environments, is done by the wind and the rain. I think that maybe the exception that I can think of off the top of my head would be like truffles. So truffles have this very sort of like um, potent smell that's attractive, not just to us, but there's whole categories of truffles that I've heard people refer to as like squirrel truffles. And they exist just so that, you know, rodents smell them and they smell amazing and the rodents dig them up because they think they want to eat them and then in the process of doing that they kind of free the spores into the air and kind of also get them on their little paws and transport them everywhere and kind of spread it. But of course truffles are a rare case in more ways than one. Primarily the nutrients inside a fruiting body are there for its own benefit, not ours. This is probably why many mushrooms have evolved to be deadly poisonous to us animals. I mean, I love mushrooms and I know a fair bit about them, but I still would never go out foraging for mushrooms that I planned to eat, unless I had an experienced guide with me like Hunter Pruitt. Once you get past your visual and common uh, identification um, methods, you move into certain color spore prints and uh, certain color um, certain color bruising patterns, and it can really get um, uh, overwhelming, especially with the amount of species that we have on this planet, right? It is so complicated, made more complicated by the fact that mushrooms change dramatically in their appearance over the course of their very rapid growth cycle. Consider the death cap, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's relatively easy to spot when it's full grown, but when it's just coming up, it looks a lot like an edible straw mushroom. People confuse them all the time, and the amatoxins in the mushroom just destroy their liver and kidneys. This is no joke. So if you wanna get your hands on some mushrooms that are more interesting than the ones they maybe have down at the grocery store, might I suggest buying a grow kit like the ones that Hunter sells. He knows exactly what species he's putting in there for you, and I used one of his kits to grow my pink oysters down in the basement. A ton of fun. There's a link to his store in the description. And if you have some kind of kit or artwork or widget to sell, consider doing it with a website from the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. You don't need to be a computer whiz like Hunter has happens to be, all you do is select a Squarespace template, put in your own photos and text, and watch your site grow faster than an oyster mushroom. Every tool you need will be in here. Squarespace handles money transactions on your site, it can calculate your sales taxes and even help you manage your inventory, keep track of how much you've sold, hey, mushrooms. Squarespace is even integrated with the parcel services that you'll need to get your product out to people, so your site can calculate shipping costs and it can help you get customers their tracking numbers. And of course, if you sell a service rather than a product, Squarespace has tools for you too, like appointment schedulers, it's all here. Even if all you're selling is, hey, I exist, look at my photography, or give me a job, you can start editing a Squarespace template for free anytime. But when you're ready to pay to take it live or to register a custom domain, remember your internet uncle Adam and go to squarespace.com slash Ragusia. Use my code Ragusia, you'll save 10%. Thank you, Squarespace. And if you're curious about how exactly mushrooms are farmed, how they're cultivated, what all that crazy gear down in Hunter's lab is for. We'll get excited because we are going to go back down there with him another day.